Okay, recording on. Okay, everyone, so we're going to go ahead and get started. I see you, Josh. Thank you. Uh, so my name is Ian McGregor, and I am with Dr. Pytel, Kelly Pytel, and we are here today presenting on wilderness therapy. Uh, so this presentation is entitled A Breath of Fresh Air. Uh, so like I said, my name is Ian. I am a graduate student at Lock Haven University that is in upstate Pennsylvania. And so I'm working on my master's. It's the CMHC, Clinical Mental Health Counseling Program. And um, most of the way through, I'm getting ready to enter kind of the last leg of that. So the practicum internship phase. So that's kind of exciting. I'm sure many of you know about that. And uh, so as far as being a Lock Haven, I just try to do as much as I can and, and stay connected with the university, doing things like conferences, publication opportunities if they come up. Uh, and then I have a couple jobs there. Uh, one is a success coach supervisor. I'm a writing tutor and a handful of other things. And I've also actually started writing for the newspaper there. So that's a lot of fun. And they've actually given me an opportunity to start my own column. So hopefully some good stuff comes out of that. Uh, some of my research interests include what you're seeing here today, wilderness and adventure therapy, along with military veteran issues, uh, self-care and wellness for both the clinician as well as the client, and um, various, various other things. Yeah, so it's exciting to be here with Ian because he's got a lot of experience in the field regarding wilderness therapy. So though he's not a clinician yet, he can speak to different types of positions out there that allowed him to be involved in this type of therapy. Um, my background, so I'm an assistant research professor at the Clearinghouse for Military Family Readiness at Penn State. Um, there we work on a lot of Department of Defense grants. So we're looking at improving programs and resources for military. We've looked at improving suicide prevention um, and intervention strategies and then um, currently, we're working with the Family Advocacy Program to focus on a new staffing model to meet the needs of clients better. How I tie to wilderness therapy is through my military interests. So in working with the military population, given the stigma that does exist around mental health, there's a lot of opportunity in nature, in wilderness, to provide services for this group that feels a little bit less threatening to the family and perhaps that service member. So um, I'll definitely be infusing a lot of those examples today, but we are really excited to be here with you. Um, and we hope that throughout this is conversational. So we'll get to know you a little bit more um, when we ask about you. But again, keep in mind that if you have experience in wilderness therapy or you're thinking of potentially being interested in taking it up, um, we'd love to hear from you via the chat or if you want to unmute, that works as well. Okay, great. So, and again, today's presentation, and like I kind of already uh, alluded to and, and Kelly had mentioned, uh, this is a topic that's near and dear to my heart. I have uh, a fair amount of experience, uh, so hopefully try to bring some of that. And again, to reiterate, we'd love for today to be conversational. Um, not here to simply lecture, but we'd love to hear from you guys, anything pertinent, relevant, anything you want to share. Um, but uh, we're looking at wilderness therapy today as a therapeutic intervention, uh, and we're going to explore it as an individual and group modality. And again, looking at some of the applications of wilderness therapy, looking at some of the basic tenets of WT wilderness therapy, and as Kelly already alluded to, some of the cultural groups um, that it might be applicable to. So this is where she mentioned getting to know you guys. So don't worry, we're not gonna force you to chat if you don't want to, but we'd love to hear from you. We wanna kind of know who's in the audience today. Uh, and also if you wouldn't mind sharing what your connection is to wilderness therapy or adventure therapy, if you've worked in it before, if you know nothing, and maybe this was just a fact-finding mission, or you know, if you just need to be here for Con Ed, whatever it is, we'd love to hear it. So this is your opportunity to share if you're feeling talkative. Hello, uh, my name is Claudia Sotelo, and I've 
never, I don't have any experience with wilderness therapy other than we have a beautiful backyard in our, in our campus. I work at an alternative campus and I know that those precious babies love to walk outside, especially the boys. If I get they're super irate, I want to go for a walk and then everything just flows after that most of the time. Um, so I'm very interested to hear uh, more about um, this modality. Awesome. Thank you for sharing. Thanks for sharing that. And we heard from Mary in the chat also saying, I don't know much about wilderness therapy, but I'm interested in learning about it. Hi, um, I'd like to share as well. Um, my name is Jacqueline Corrado. I'm from New Jersey. I am in my master's program for clinical mental health and art therapy. I uh, like the outside. I'm currently walking right now. But um, other than that, I think I recently heard something about wilderness therapy. I didn't know enough, though. That's why I'm here. Um, but also, I think it's a great opportunity, one, because of the pandemic, being outside gives us a little bit more opportunity to maybe gather in larger groups. Um, and then also, like the art therapy aspect, um, you know, found objects, I think, is a great idea in this wilderness aspect. So I'm very interested in hearing this lecture. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you, Jacqueline. You're my hero right now. I, I, I should have thought to, I should have done this outside. I didn't even consider that. Um, we heard from a couple other people in the chat. So Nicole used with service member clients and those military connected more nature based than wilderness. Um, we'll definitely talk about those differences. And then, oh, a couple of people are chatting more. Some people in the context of treatment of substance use, but would like to learn more about integrating on a local level. Uh, don't know much about wilderness therapy. And then we've got a master's student um, and you have the perfect backdrop to offer wilderness therapy for trauma affected youth. We'll definitely talk about how it is used or mentioned a lot in literature related to trauma and with youth. So um, getting ideas for affordable way to do this potentially in the future. Well, it's great to hear from everyone. Thank you for chiming in. You're all coming from very different perspectives with very different interests um, and different levels of knowledge. And that's okay. I would say that primarily our presentation is geared towards those who want to learn more about it. So more of that basic foundational level. Um, but once we get to the end of the presentation, we can really shift gears in helping you identify what are next steps. Is it that you are just interested in this presentation for more exposure, or are you actually interested in potentially going out and, you know, running a wilderness therapy program? So keep that in mind as we go on. And like I said, if there's anything you want to chime in with as we go forward, questions, comments, please, please do. Okay, great. So this slide is, is pretty basic. I just wanted to take a moment, pause, and look at some of the nomenclature that gets tossed around. And again, like, uh, like Kelly had alluded to, um, this is meant to allow you to better understand, walk away saying, okay, I know a little more about this, this industry. Um, and I, I didn't expect a, a lot of people would be here today with you know, thorough knowledge and work experience within this field. So we'll just take a look real quick here. Wilderness therapy, I'll often abbreviate WT. Uh, and then the first box there on the upper left, adventure therapy, AT is often its abbreviation. And I just want to take a moment and pause there. These are going to be the most common uh, two, two uh, names that you'll see in wilderness therapy. And actually, they get used interchangeably a lot. And it gets a little bit confusing because adventure therapy can also be used to explain something that's slightly more specific where we're using high adventure activities within a setting of wilderness therapy. So again, kind of confusing because they're used interchangeably and they're synonymous, but AT can also be something slightly more specific. Um, but we're not going to split hairs like that today. I just wanted to point that out. Uh, but through today's presentation, it's going to be wilderness therapy, adventure therapy. For all intents and purposes, they're going to mean the same thing. Uh, and then we're looking at OBH or outdoor behavioral healthcare, WEPs, uh, wilderness experience programs, uh, we have wilderness treatment programs, WATs or wilderness adventure therapy, and then adventure-based therapy. And there's actually other names, so it gets even more confusing, but these are kind of the big six, and I've already identified kind of the big two. So if you, hopefully that makes sense. So 
just taking a look at, at what it is, uh, what is wilderness therapy? Uh, it's certainly something that utilizes group and individual uh, modalities and other traditional therapy techniques. And it's within the wilderness setting. And we're gonna be focusing on using that wilderness setting with therapeutic intent. So less casually, more intentional. And this type of therapy utilizes uh, what we have outdoor adventure expeditions. And something that is very common, you're gonna see activities like reflection, discussions, uh, a lot of backcountry or primitive skills to foster growth uh, personally, uh, professionally, interpersonally. And um, those backcountry skills, primitive skills, are gonna be things like camping, shelter building, um, fire starting, things like that. Uh, water purification couldn't be involved. Uh, so in conjunction with expedition-based and camping-based adventures, uh, including individual and group psychotherapy and always by licensed professionals focusing, uh, as we know it, on client progress. The difference between expedition and camping-based, uh, camping-based is more of what we call, you're gonna park basically at a base camp. When I say park, I mean, your body's not like an RV, uh, but a lot of times you'll hike out to a spot and then that'll be your base camp. And that's more camping-based, a lot of primitive skills. Where that expedition base, that's kind of what I referred to earlier, that AT, adventure, adventure therapy. And that could be things like whitewater rafting expeditions, backpacking, could be ice climbing, whitewater rafting, all sorts of things. The list goes on and on. And uh, WT is the prescriptive use of wilderness experiences, again, by licensed mental health practitioners and focusing on the needs of the participants. So what does it look like? I'm not sure what's in everyone's head right now when you picture wilderness therapy. If you're picturing bear grills, um, you know, rappelling down the side of, a, of an ice cliff or, or simply sitting at a picnic table behind your facility or somewhere in between. Uh, but these are some photos that I took. Uh, they're not from the internet, they're not stock photos. I, again, I referred earlier, I alluded to working in this industry and I, and I have worked in the wilderness therapy, adventure therapy, experiential experiential education industry, outdoor education. And so what I had was a job at a facility. It was the only one like it in the world. It's a high adventure boarding school for kids with learning disabilities. And so it's a very specific niche and it was an incredible opportunity. It was out of North Carolina. Uh, but that boarding school utilized wilderness therapy and adventure therapy uh, foundations. And so that's really where I learned a lot about this. Uh, but again, I was not a licensed practitioner. I had a different role where I was kind of leading trips. So that's what you're seeing here. Um, if you're curious, on the far left, that was in West Virginia. We had a back, uh, it was a backpacking and rock climbing expedition. So this was the backpacking leg of it. And we had a ton of rain. So we're slogging through some mud there. And um, the woman you see helping, helping the one student, she was my, my co-facilitator on that. So it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of hard work, uh, but awesome opportunities for growth for everyone involved, uh, the trip leaders included. In the middle, we're there hiking through a canyon, and that is in Big Bend National Park in Texas. If you've ever been, you know all about it. If you haven't, perhaps you've heard of it. It's really beautiful. Actually, you have to get on a waiting list to get out there. A lot of these national parks, you'll find... Um, a lot of people trying to go there, but we're there hiking through a canyon to come out to a really pretty uh, overlook. And on the far right, this one's pretty interesting. This is at the confluence of Texas and Mexico. So you can see we're hiking there on the right and we're headed into a canyon. And within that canyon is the, uh, it's the Rio Grande in between um, what is Texas and Mexico. Fun fact about the Rio Grande in Mexico, they don't, they don't actually call it the Rio Grande. They call it the Rio Bravo. So if you go to Mexico and you ask, where's the Rio Grande, uh, there's a good chance they don't know what you're talking about. Kind of interesting. And these are, those are just three photos. I have thousands, but um, good ones. So I wanted to incorporate this, and hopefully this is interesting to you. As you can see in the bottom left, I got this from Google Earth. And what this is, the reason this has relevance is I wanted you all to be able to understand where some of these uh, companies, these agencies are located. So these are gonna be, I think this is about 50 different organizations 
and agencies that deliver wilderness therapy, adventure therapy across the US. And again, the relevance here is you can see they kind of exist in pockets. There's certain concentrations uh, from east to west. So when you look at the east, it looks like there's a few in the northeast. And this map is, is, is not really doing it justice because there really aren't. Uh, there really aren't. If, if you want to be on the east coast and look into wilderness adventure therapy, if you look down in the North Carolina area, if you know your geography, uh, there is a heavy concentration down there. And that's where I was located outside of the Asheville, North Carolina area. It was interesting about that area is when you drive on the highway there, just about every couple exits, every exit, every second, every third exit, you're going to see another uh, sign for a wilderness therapy or adventure therapy company. And so in that area, this is a very well-known topic. People work there. They have sons, daughters, cousins, brothers that work there. Their friends work there. And there's a tight-knit community. All the companies, the agencies know each other. They get along. They have a professional relationship. I think that's really cool. Uh, but then for the rest of the East Coast, there's really not much going on. And then if you move all the way out to the West, you can see California, Oregon, and Washington. And there's certainly going to be uh, peppered up and down the West Coast, uh, some different outdoor wilderness therapy, venture therapy companies. I'm sure that doesn't shock you. California, very outdoors uh, and the rest of the coast. Uh, but then the heaviest pocket is going to be a little bit east of that. And that's going to be in the states that are Utah, Colorado, Arizona, New Mexico. And I'm not sure if that's surprising to you or not, but this is for me kind of the heart of the, of the country for wilderness therapy. There's a lot of companies out there, kind of like I described in North Carolina, but to a much greater extent. Uh, all the companies know each other. They have relationships. They get along. They are producing a lot of research out there. The, the little bit of research that there is, evidence-based research, a lot of it's coming from that pocket. And, um, you know, University of Utah out of Salt Lake City is a big one. Uh, but when you think outdoors, you might think Utah, Colorado, and that's kind of the reason. And what's, what's interesting is where these organizations are located are basically areas that are very outdoorsy based on the culture and the lifestyle. And then those people who are also interested in mental health, the confluence of those two interests, and that's basically where you get a lot of these companies originating from. Maybe it'll spread across the country. Maybe it will continue to exist in those uh, concentrated pockets. We'll see. But you can see already how that could, that could pose an issue if you're trying to work there, if you're trying to send your kids there, if you're trying to go there yourself, do some um, reconnaissance and get some information. Uh, you probably have to take a flight or a drive at least. Uh, so this is just three of the important organizations I want you all to walk away with uh, an understanding of comprehension that these exist. Uh, these are kind of the big ones, especially the, the first two there. Uh, so the Outdoor Behavioral Health uh, Healthcare Council, that are known as the OBH Council, uh, it, they promote standards and excellence across the industry, kind of the way the ACA does uh, in, our, in our industry. And uh, you can see there below it, there's kind of that gold, gold hallmark type sticker uh, this is the gold standard in the industry. Any um, wilderness therapy organization that wants to be successful and taken seriously, wants to improve their marketing abilities, they're going to need to be uh, accredited by the OBH. And so if you don't take anything away from today or, or almost nothing, try to remember this one and, and look them up on Google, check out their website. Uh, but it's pretty interesting. They have a lot of information there. They have some research uh, and they also if you're interested later in saying, I might wanna work there, I might wanna check out a couple of these websites of these companies that, that Ian was talking about, that's the place to do it. If you go onto their site and across the top, there's a tab where you can click on like friends of the OBH, something of that nature. And it's gonna list 40 or 50 different agencies. And then each one has a link to their website. And I use that all the time when I wanna do my own personal research, just on what's going on in the industry. Uh, and then if you bump over to the middle, that is the OBH um, Center, Outdoor Behavioral Healthcare Center. And what this is, this is an extension of the OBH Council. Uh, they basically realize that, you know, just like our industry as a whole, holistically, we need to back everything up by evidence-based research. Um, and so there wasn't a lot of that in that industry. So they created this agency to specifically produce that research. So a lot of the research for today's uh, presentation came from, from that entity. 
And I recommend if you're trying to look up any, any research on this or after today's presentation, check out the OBH Center. And they're inter interestingly, they're located out of uh, University of New Hampshire. And why that's interesting is uh, it's a very small, tight-knit community of the people within the OBH and those that produce the research. Uh, UNH actually has a very interesting uh, dual masters in kinesiology and um, it's kinesiology and social work. And so they're marrying those two things, those two fields together. And then that's where they set up the OBH center and the president for the OBH actually teaches at University of New Hampshire and there's a few others. So really, again, I don't know, you could see that as a good thing or a bad thing, but it's a very small tight knit community where everyone knows everyone. Uh, and then that last box is the Therapeutic Adventure Professional Group. They're an extension of uh, the Association for Experiential Education. So again, promoting education uh, and also wilderness and adventure therapy. A lot of good stuff coming out of those three. So how is what we're talking about today, wilderness therapy, different from just recreational or educational activities? Uh, certainly a prescriptive use of adventure experiences by professionals, uh, kinesthetically engaging across uh, different human domains. And so we're looking at that kinesthetic, that very hands-on concrete experiential methodology, establishing connections between the, uh, the client's life and also the therapeutic experiences and the treatment plan. Uh, we're focusing on the client's therapeutic goals. And again, across those domains, uh, a very dynamic client counselor relationship exists uh, keyword there being dynamic. It certainly is a dynamic relationship. You're wearing many hats, um, and this is uh, definitely this is definitely a field where it's going to look a little different than working in a very sterile office environment, meeting with your client for 45 minutes once a week, uh, sitting across from each other in chairs. So that very very dynamic relationship is important. And it's enhanced by the shared experiences of, of the therapist being in the field uh, and the client's active involvement in everything from goal setting for the treatment plan, decision making, and achieving outcomes. And again, being intentional about the design, the application of chosen uh, therapeutic activities, and a heavy emphasis on the use of the natural environment. And that kind of goes without saying, uh, but including a little bit of discomfort, stress, whether that's perceived or actual uh, discomfort and stress that usually plays a really big role in adventure therapy. So different components of, uh, of this type of therapy, the uh, wilderness therapy model uses immersion act experiences and activities, and that's gonna be used for assessment, collaboration on goals, and a course of treatment that coincides with that outdoor experience. Uh, the clients are gonna take on a very active role, uh, maybe more so than in your traditional environment uh, in therapy and for the entire uh, process and all the experiences. Uh, you'll see a little more about that here in a minute uh, when we talk about the opportunity to decide uh, their level of involvement. Uh, the focus is often on teamwork and social interactions and this this is huge in wilderness therapy. This, when I think of this industry, it's, it's kind of the first thing that comes to mind is this uh, very social environment, these group therapy sessions that are immersive and ongoing. And that can actually be supported by family therapy. So we're looking at individual uh, partnered with group therapy sessions. And then often what you'll see in a minute when, when Kelly talks about it is one of the major niche groups is gonna be adolescents and teens involved in, in some of these uh, types of treatment. And often it's because of uh, some kind of dysfunction within the family. And so you can partner family therapy as either concurrent or some kind of follow-up. And uh, we're often incorporating the group adventure experiences. Uh, like I'd mentioned, incorporating some of that use stress or some of that positive stress uh, to, to help bolster the overall experience. Um, and again, back to the, the natural environment, and there's a lot of research supporting uh, nature as a peaceful therapeutic setting, uh, and it could be a really positive thing for conducting uh, the therapeutic uh, sessions that you're going to have individually and as a group. And tons of metaphors. This is another one that comes to mind right away. When we look at opportunities for metaphors, you know, one example that comes to mind, the first one that comes to mind 
will be in rock climbing if you've ever done it uh, or you've seen someone do it, perhaps indoor or outdoor. We're looking at, you know, being on the ground, choosing our line, which is basically planning and strategizing, figuring out what success looks like and defining that. Do I want to go halfway, three quarters of the way, all the way to the top? Looking at your resources, that's your climbing buddy, your rappel uh, friend who's going to rappel you. Uh, and then having a go at it, giving it your all, struggling, failing, trying again, deciding that's enough for today, or I'm going to keep going, I'm going to push through, changing up your approach, coming up with a different way to, to tackle this problem, and maybe summiting and reaching the top, maybe going halfway uh, and feeling good, feeling proud of what you've accomplished. And, you know, you can just see from, from what I just uh, explored here, and that's a very, just a brief part of it. Uh, but so many metaphors for overcoming challenges in life, planning, strategizing, using resources, defining what success looks like. Uh, and it's, it's a really beautiful process. So metaphors are a plenty in this industry. And uh, the wilderness uh, therapy practitioners are mental health professionals trained, obviously, in individual and in group uh, modalities, but also to ensure a safe and effective uh, experience uh, when conducting wilderness and adventure facilitation. And just to step in real quickly, so we talked a lot about therapeutic interventions. We're now going to talk about vehicles of change. But those who are in the audience, you guys have been pretty quiet. What are you, when you're, those who are using wilderness therapy, anything that you would like to add, any of the experiences that you would like to add as it relates more to this counselor role therapeutic relationship? or any questions you have about how the what the therapeutic relationship looks like. Maybe not yet. All right, Anne, well, let's cool. talk about the vehicles of change and then some other components of wilderness therapy and then check back in with everyone. All right. Uh, some of the elements of vehicle of change. Uh, the first one is pretty obvious, play and fun. And I know that resonates with everyone here, I'm hoping. Uh, but play and fun, again, often our target market could be the target niche or those that are involved in wilderness therapy are going to be kids, adolescents, teens. Uh, and so we utilize play and, and fun to be able to break down some of those walls, uh, hopefully decreasing client resistance to the therapeutic process. And sometimes that can be quick and sometimes that can take a little bit, uh, but then also to hopefully increase client participation. So play and fun, for me, this is great. Uh, and it's not just for kids, it's for everybody. So uh, one of my personal beliefs is that we need to have more of this play and fun. And so I just talked about focusing on the youth, uh, but we also discussed earlier, this can be okay for adults as well. And Kelly mentioned, um, military service members and veterans. And let's not forget, they like to have fun too and play and seeing a bunch of adults laughing and having fun is, is pretty beautiful. Uh, so we're looking at the parallel and identical processes. Uh, these probably resonate with you, but the parallel process is that uh, metaphoric process uh, similar to rock climbing, uh, where we're looking at some of the things from the treatment plan and some of those goals. And then can we utilize an activity that can be metaphorical and we can then bring some of those issues uh, into the light so we can explore them. And then the identical process is just that. It's, you know, perhaps your treatment plan involves um, improved health and wellness through more exercise and better eating. And those are certainly things that we, we focus on in this industry. You know, the kids aren't, you know, or the, the clients aren't sitting around uh, eating junk food. And there's always a focus on wellness, uh, health, exercise, healthy eating, cooking, uh, even shopping for healthy groceries and, and executing a meal plan is usually uh, a big part of it. Uh, here and now feedback, this one's huge. Tons and tons of opportunities for here and now feedback. Again, the role of the therapist is gonna look a little bit different in wilderness therapy. And if you go back later to the OBH, their website, and you look at some of those organizations, go ahead and explore a couple of their websites, click on the job portal, and, and take a look and see what those jobs look like. But you'll see a lot of times a uh, wilderness therapy company might be hiring a therapist where they, they want you to work four days a week with a three day weekend and two and a half days are in the office and one and a half to two days are in the field. 
And so you're going to be out there with your clients conducting group therapy, conducting individual therapy, and then hoping, helping to kind of oversee processes, maybe observing. Uh, and so there's tons and tons of experiences uh, for the clinician to give that here and now feedback. May I interrupt for a question? Please, yeah. Um, so do, can these um, interventions be, or sessions be like a, like, I don't know how far it goes, but you know, like tent sleepover, or is it just, you know, a couple of hours? What is the typical, like, how is it different than in office um, time-wise? Yeah, that's a great question. And you know what? I don't even know if I had that in today's presentation because for me, I just, it's in my head already. And I, I, I'm so glad you asked that. Um, it, it actually is quite immersive. Uh, again, if you go look later at some of these, uh, these companies, a lot of times what it is, is multiple months. So a client will go off to a wilderness therapy program and they could be there for six weeks, eight weeks, 12 weeks. And what they'll be doing is it's an immersion experience where they will be living in a group environment uh, with a group of like eight or 10 total uh, participants. And then what you'll have are, there are these people that wear many, many hats and they're mentors and field guides and they lead adventures and expeditions. And then the therapist is more of a professional uh, clinician type occupation where then they'll come out in the field and meet the group who's been there for five days, 10 days, 15 days, a month. And then they'll sit in on some of those, hey, how's everything been going in that individual, talking to the group, maybe around the campfire and processing and reflecting activities and utilizing that support group uh, methodology. And so, yes, definitely to your, to your question, it's a lot of camping, it's a lot of tenting, uh, it's a lot of backpacking. You could be on a, a backpacking expedition that might be 10 days long and you might backpack 50 miles, 40 miles. And you're camping every night, setting up base camp, waking up in the morning, packing everything up and continuing on with maps and compasses and weather and, and stopping for meals. Uh, and then the therapist or the counselor will somehow intervene into that. They'll probably take a personal vehicle. They know where the group is at and they'll go out and, and meet. Uh, and then a lot of times when the group finally comes back to the base camp, which is like some kind of structured building, it could be an office or usually just a really big housing structure uh, where the participants or, or clients will spend a few days and then that therapist will again have individual sessions as well as, as group sessions. Does that paint a totally different picture for what you were kind of envisioning? No, I mean, it definitely helped expand on it because I, you know, I can envision it as this long expedition and I can envision it as like, you know, for a family, you know, like if they need a, just a, a one-off like weekend, it could be a shorter expedition. Um, I guess my, my follow-up question is, for this like specialization, is there an additional credential specifically for this training? Um, is there a particular training where you have to meet like a physical level uh, to know how to be like, okay, I can prove I can do this tent stuff. I can climb this mountain. Like, you know, what do you have to prove to say I am well equipped for this as a clinician? Yeah. No, that's a, that's a great question. Um, as far as I know, there is not, and, and this is coming from me, again, if you go on to some of these company websites, one I really like out West, I don't want to promote anybody, I have no affiliation, but I like Aspiro, they're out of Utah, and I've actually been out there, and I spent two weeks with their company, and I went through their training, and I saw everything from the inside, and that was a lot of fun, and the people that work there are licensed, um, they're LPCs or LCSWs, um, but they happen to maybe grow up in Utah. So they're familiar with whitewater rafting and rock climbing. Uh, and then because of the confluence of those two interests, then they apply at that company. Now, a lot of times they're going to require you to have basic, uh, it's going to be first aid, CPR, uh, likely your uh, wilderness first responder, your WFR, which takes about a week to get. It's like a really intense first aid course. Um, and then what's even better is if you're a wilderness EMT, uh, so I, I'm all those things that I just, I just said, um, but I need to take a few day course to convert my EMT into a wilderness EMT. So that's, those are really desirable skills in that, in that field. 
Um, but if you can offer that, that's better, but you don't have to. And again, back to your, your question is, if you're going to work in this field, likely you own your own outdoor gear and you've been kayaking and you've been on a backpacking trip and you've done some of these things. Yeah. It's um, like you're already your interests. Exactly. But the thing yeah. is you don't have to, you absolutely do not have to have any of those skills and they're going to teach you. And, you know, just to kind of put, I hate the idea of a hierarchy, but if you would work at one of these companies, you come in as a clinician. So you're, you're kind of a big deal. Most of the the people that work at these companies are what I was as a, as a field guide, as a trip leader, uh, as a field mentor, where you're teaching life skills and, and backcountry skills and keeping everybody safe and keeping the group on target. Uh, but as the clinician, you know, you come in and everyone's so happy to see you and you get to work with whatever participants uh, or ever clients that are available to you, whatever you're, you're um, asked to work with. And it's just a really neat environment. And so you don't necessarily have to be like, okay, now we're going to go whitewater rafting. I just also happen to be a whitewater rafting guide, which I am, but, but you don't have to be, you could just be like, let's do this and essentially be a tourist and be like, let's have some fun, you know, and you'd pick it up really quick too. After a couple of weeks, you'd be speaking the lingo and you'd have your own gear and, you know, nobody would know the difference. So, but no, there's not a different certification but they're mm-hmm. going to ask you to be licensed in that state, you know, with portability where it is right now. Yeah. That was um, my, my next question of yeah. like, I didn't know if you knew of like how difficult, since it seems like these um, companies are all, you know, I mean, I guess you could say, Oh, I'll only do East coast. But then again, you have all these different States and the portability. And I was curious about that, but I guess that's it's the issue. Tricky. You have to be licensed. You do have to be licensed in the state. Now here, I'll throw you one. I'll throw you for a curve. The company I mentioned, Aspiro, they're out of Utah. Now they have a sister company in uh, Costa Rica. So, and that's called uh, Pure Life. And I, I've, I've met with them before as well and, and chatted with them. Um, and if I, if I have this correct, they are licensed under Utah state, state laws because their, their home base is, is out of Salt Lake City, Utah. And so that gets a little tricky. So then you're like, do I need an international license to work there? Uh, and uh, I'm nearly certain that you would need a Utah state license to work there and then be able to go abroad and work under that, you know, their platform and their, their license. So it gets a little tricky. And I'm at the point now where I'm looking at practicum and internship and, uh, and then picking a state to get licensed. And I'm from PA. But I'm like, if I want to work in this field, do I need to go and instead work for two years in Utah? So then my, my license becomes a Utah state license and then I can work. If I get licensed in PA and there's no wilderness therapy programs in PA, like why am I even having this conversation right now? You know? So yeah, it's tricky. It's frustrating, but you know, portability is, is I just presented on that a couple of days ago and hopefully with the interstate compact and, you know, hopefully better things to come. Just to go back to one thing, there are programs out there, not our program. So we are at Lockheaven University. We don't have any electives that focus on wilderness therapy. There are some master's programs out there that do have electives or courses that are more geared toward this for that exposure. Um, This is kind of a point that we're hoping to make later on about training and um, how to go about that. But there are also what I've seen cert- certification programs. So much like you'd have like a telemental health certification or um, military and veteran, you know, some of those are far and few uh, trauma certification. You can find those out there and they will give you some exposure and a certain level of knowledge when we're talking about cultural competency working with our clients, knowing the interventions that we're using. Um, But to Ian's point, some of these programs out there, there's that hands-on training within the company as well. So while that certification may not be required for some programs, I do just caution you that for others, it may be. If you're looking at starting a program, you're going to want to make sure that you've got some sort of credentialing or something to say, you know, I am competent to do this. Yeah, precisely. Like I mentioned that OBH um, gold star, kind of the way you would get KCREP accredited, you'd want to be uh, OBH accredited and then they're going to lay out for you everything you need to do. That'd be a really good place to start. 
There's a couple more questions, Ian. Sure. I see we're chat. already at 1141. We're, we're cruising. Yeah. So um, I think we did talk a, a little bit more about the interaction of mental health professionals during how does wine on one sessions in the wilderness look like? And then it's also kind of related, but do any wilderness therapy programs and interventions exist that offer half a day or a few hours or do all almost or last almost overnight? So I don't know any that are just for half a day. Um, if you do some, some research, there's, a, there's, a, there's something in this industry called like the three day effect. And if you look that up, that's a, um, a searchable term in nature. And there, there's a lot of science that supports things, interesting things that start to happen after three days and uh, different parts of your brain light up, that creative uh, artistic components of the prefrontal cortex really start to light up and kind of the city life or the suburb life melts away. Our phones being disconnected for a few days is, is really uh, an important part of this process. And you start to see things through like a different lens. And so definitely look that up. Florence Williams wrote a book about the nature effect and it's, it's really interesting. And, and she does a podcast then later where she hooks up with uh, some service members and military veterans. And that's a cool little free podcast on um, Audible from Amazon. You could check that out. Uh, but as far as those one-on-ones, again, if you can just imagine entering the field from your own personal vehicle or hiking out and then greeting the group and then saying, okay, we're gonna do these one-on-ones. So, so while the two expert, you know, outdoor Bear grills type field mentors are doing their thing with the group, you're gonna take that one client and you're gonna go sit alone, you know, on a, um, you know, near the group, but not so far where you're overlooking something beautiful or sitting somewhere peaceful near uh, a lake, you know, still as glass or, or whatever it might be near the ocean. Uh, and having that conversation, maybe there's a picnic table, you know, I don't know. Um, but you're going to be having that one-on-one -on -one the same way you would in the office. Uh, hey, what's going on? How's it going? And, and starting that, um, that dialogue and then checking in on goals. How are things going? I know you were dealing with this uh, and, and kind of moving through, taking notes if you need to, and then updating, updating your notes later. Uh, and then kind of just going through like one after the next, after the next, you know, you might take breaks in between. Uh, so, you know, you're going to be working uh, and then maybe you guys have dinner and then later there might be a campfire where everyone does like a group therapy session. If that kind of, if you can imagine and, and picture that. And that's not the only way, that's just a common way. Yeah. So it's definitely, if you can imagine a one-on-one -on -one session, it's just outside in the wilderness as part of this program. Like Ian had mentioned, there's most likely going to be a treatment plan or goals that they're working on. And it's that therapist's goal to help support them in that. So we should keep moving and, and we might have to skip around to squeeze this in. I love the questions that for me is almost more important than some of the. We touched the... on a, a lot of that, but if we just go through the role. Yeah. So this is a, I'll hit on this really quickly, uh, the role of risk. It's one of the first questions people always ask about, you know, they think about whitewater rafting and they think about risk. Uh, so certainly we have a certain amount of ambient risk from our day-to-day, -day, you know, lives, uh, whether it be in suburbia or, or whatnot. Uh, so there is an elevated risk to some of these activities. Uh, but the major takeaway from this slide is that risk is managed, as you can imagine. There's going to be a lot of planning. There's going to be that accreditation, uh, accreditation process where it's gonna tell you how to manage that risk. You're gonna work with risk management companies where that's all they do. Uh, and then of course, you're going to be, uh, you're gonna have insurance. So you're gonna work with the underwriters and the insurance companies to come up with a plan that, that specifies how you're gonna manage every little corner of every possible risk. And of course, life happens, uh, but you still have to have that plan in place. So uh, managing risks, updating, evaluating risks, uh, the second bullet there talks about something I, I think is important to point out. Uh, it's called challenge by choice. And basically this is talking about the client's uh, perception of risk can be just as important as the actual level of risk. And the way you manage that is by having a rule of thumb or a gold standard that says challenge by choice. And this is every company I, I've ever researched has this. And what it means is that the client's never forced to do anything. They retain 
uh, the, the opportunity to make decisions and say, I want to engage in this, I don't. And this can be really powerful because uh, it allows the client to feel empowered to make decisions, but also to change their decisions because they have so many opportunities to say, I don't want to do this, I don't feel comfortable. But then a week later say, okay, I saw everyone else do it. I've been thinking about it, kind of marinating on it. I think I want to do it. Uh, and then when they choose to, to participate, and it's just something that's, that's really powerful, sometimes intangible, uh, but it can be very empowering for clients. Um, but let's, let's see, again, lots of opportunities to work through challenges, learn and utilize coping strategies. Uh, obviously, amazing opportunities to foster resilience and to kind of manage stressors and learn how to manage stressors. These are huge components of wilderness therapy. Yeah, and one thing just to point out here, we do have look at the ethical responsibility that you have as providers. So, you know, there is going to be an informed consent or an application that the individuals that you're working with are filling out. So they upfront know risks, benefits of the wilderness therapy program that they're part of. But you do want to make sure that you are really outlining the role of risk. So considering that these are individuals who are out hiking, um, we're looking at wilderness as there's a lot of unknowns to some extent when you're comparing that setting, that therapeutic setting to that of a counseling office. So when you're comparing those two things, um, we know as our, it's our ethical responsibility to keep our clients safe. And so you want to make sure that when you're using this type of intervention, you are um, upfront and honest about what that looks like for risks and benefits. And when we switch over to benefits, um, there is, and we'll go through this pretty quickly because it seems like there's a lot of questions and we want to make sure we have more time for questions at the end. But if you look at this slide, um, there are a lot of examples in the literature looking at the effectiveness for substance use, um, developing self-efficacy. Um, you can see here that there's even skill development. It's adaptable for reaching a bunch of diverse groups. So we've talked a little bit about youth. We've talked um, a little bit about um, veterans or the mil it being used for the military. Um, so there is research out there about these areas, um, but there, there is also a lack of research. So something that Ian and I were talking about when we were doing this presentation is where are the gaps? So some of the literature is dated, some of the literature is more focused on one group over the other. And so when you're looking at what's the effectiveness or what do these programs look like, when you're thinking of the research, it could be very hard to measure. So how do you measure the effectiveness of the wilderness program? We're looking at all of those vehicles of change. We're looking about different, we're looking at the different components that these programs are offering. So what are you measuring? Think of how difficult it can be to measure nature, nature interventions. Um, so when you're looking at the benefits, there is some, like I said, to support these areas. So reduction of trauma, reduction of depression. Um, but keep in mind too, that if you are interested in going into this, uh, therapy or this approach, we do need more research to, to better understand implementation and evaluation of programs and interventions within the program. Um, moving to supportive approach across various cultural groups. Um, so you can see here and I'll let you guys read this. There's, um, when we're looking at different social skills, this is more of a slide that is really elaborating on the last slide, but it lets you show that across different ages, across um, different genders, there is support. Um, if you look at urban versus rural settings, that's another when we're thinking of cultural groups that this can support. So thinking of bringing more of the therapeutic effects of nature to the city life. And then of course we've mentioned the military a couple of times. Um, one, one program that I'm really familiar with is Project Healing Waters, which is fly fishing. Um, so there's over 206 
active programs, and this is really geared towards uh, veterans and helping them through the full spectrum of fly fishing, uh, reintegrate and recover from emotional and physical trauma, mostly associated with combat. But it's recognized as this innovative leader and model in the field of therapeutic outdoor recreational programs. Um, and it's really used for this therapeutic tool. So a lot of the participants are saying things like, this saved my life, or um, I found hope again on the river. So again, this is really bringing out for different groups that you may be interested in working with, children, veterans, um, individuals I'm thinking now who are socially isolated because of COVID. If, if there's a group that you are passionate about and you wanna bring this approach to, there's so many ways that it can be beneficial given all of the therapeutic components that we've mentioned before. Nature, the biggest one of all. What, where are you at? What are you doing? And how is that supporting these various social, emotional, cognitive components? We do highlight that there are some limitations. So, um, you know, for this particular approach, it is a tight knit community. Um, so it's not, when we say that, uh, this also relates a little bit to geographically remote. So this could be difficult to get into if you were interested in being part of a wilderness therapy program. So for example, um, Anne had mentioned before too, we both live in PA. If we go back to remembering what that map looks like, our options for getting involved are um, more difficult given the area that we're in. There's also, um, if we're looking more on the, the counselor side of things, research space, um, as I mentioned before, it's difficult to always know the effectiveness of this therapeutic approach because we know that there's a lot of programs running out there, but there's not a lot of uh, research coming out of it. For clients, uh, there can be some negative stigmas if they don't understand exactly what the program in, is and how it can work in a therapeutic component. Or again, coming back to some of those risks, um, think about, you know, as a parent, would you feel comfortable putting your child in one of these programs versus the traditional group therapy program um, in an outpatient counseling office? But that said, too, there are limited providers. So one of the things we wanted to emphasize, um, and I'll switch to the next slide just because I want to leave time again. But, you know, we wanted to know what your level of use was going to be as a provider. So is this something that you're looking to infuse? So are you looking to infuse components of wilderness therapy? Is that why you're here? Or are you looking more to run a program? Um, as a provider, you know, there's, there's different areas of the world where you can find more providers. Um, so for clients, if they're interested in this in PA, um, good luck to them because it's going to be a lot more difficult. You actually hear more of the stories of people traveling to these programs. So is it cost effective for families at that point? So really, if you are interested in this, it would be great to consider what can I offer my area? How can I bring this to Pennsylvania? So like Ian, how do you bring a program to Pennsylvania to make this more accessible for individuals who are interested? As I mentioned before, that uh, fly fishing program is something that's across many different areas and states. So how can we bring more of this to our area? Um, it, it's not, a, another thing that we thought was important to note is when we're talking about master's level clinicians, as counselor educators, I know I'm guilty of this as well. When I'm talking about traditional therapies or theories out there, I don't often come to wilderness therapy and infuse it into my courses, which does put a disservice. Um, it's a disservice for my students because they don't necessarily know that it's an option out there, something that they could go to look to if they were interested in it. Because to some extent, it seems a little bit inaccessible for me to say, oh, you're interested, let me help support you in doing that. Um, I can't honestly say, well, here, this is 
a great resource for you to go to in our area, for example. Um, so I know that that was a really, really quick ending. We had a lot of really great conversation. I do want to just go back to, there was one comment in the- There was one about insurance that I wanted to hit on quick. You, you had mentioned about cost. Um, and I, I did look this up beforehand because I thought somebody might ask, but uh, yes, there are some companies that are able to cut costs with insurance. So uh, if you yourself want to send your teen or put yourself in a water therapy program, if you have insurance, it can be covered, but it's often not fully covered. I, what I saw were companies anywhere from covering a small fraction to a medium size to a rather large fraction of the total cost. Uh, but a huge limitation is this is pretty expensive. Uh, and the places that I've seen, unfortunately, a lot of times are some of the wealthier families and some of the wealthier people uh, in our country utilizing these services. It's great for them, but it's a, it's a huge shortcoming uh, for the rest of the industry and for those that, that aren't uh, affluent, uh, well off financially. So if you can use your insurance, if you can you know, uh, wrestle with that conversation and see if you can get them to, to pay for some or, or hopefully all of it. Uh, and then of course, a lot of companies do, do things like scholarships as well. And that's really cool because a lot of times some of these companies actually make pretty good money. And so they want to give back. And so they'll, they'll set up scholarships for a few people that would have never had the chance otherwise. Yeah, any other, we have two minutes. Any other final questions? I think we address them when looking. Um, Catherine, can you talk about engagement of diverse populations? with wilderness therapy, is there active outreach for diverse um, assuming populations? So engagement, I would say, yes, there is engagement. Um, it's really gonna depend on the population that you are talking about. So again, using the military as an example, um, there is a good level of engagement like in those fly fishing programs and those hiking programs. When we're talking about active outreach, I would say they are smaller. They tend to be smaller groups. I think just the military as a whole, given their culture, whenever you're looking at group therapy, it's just smaller in numbers. Um, it's harder to bring the access those individuals and bring them into the therapeutic setting. But as word of mouth improve, like I would say from the individuals who are part of the experience, as that increases, um, more people do tend to get involved. I just know as a provider who tries to service um, the military, which again is a di it's a diverse group. We've got some we've got some stigma and stuff going on related to seeking mental health services. It's hard for me to go out there and do outreach for group therapy, um, individual therapy. I can do all of that that all the outreach that I want, but ultimately it's you know, the select number of people who truly do reach out and want to be involved. And then word of mouth, typically from individuals that were part of that culture. You know, I am not a veteran, so my perspective is very different. But if other veterans would say, you know, this was a really powerful experience for me, um, I would really recommend you be a part of it. It's kind of that, that brotherhood or that word of mouth that's needed to get more people involved. I would imagine that that's very similar with others. Um, when we're talking about the younger populations, engagement may be a little bit different because you know parents are signing up kids for these programs. So consider that too. Engagement might be, it feel a little bit more mandated in that sense, but as you know, youth get more and more involved, they get more and more invested in what they're doing. So that's, that's a tough question, a really, really great question, but tough question to answer because I think it does vary so drastically depending on the specific population that you're working with. Is it possible that we could get the um, presentation um, shared with those who want it? Yes. Yeah, so I think the conference has a place for us to upload the information. If not, if you guys would like to share your email in the chat, we'll just take a screenshot and verify that we send that to you directly. So you don't have to go looking for it. So 
So if anybody has any other questions, of course, you can reach out via email. Was our, was our, I assume our emails were included in this presenter information? Yeah, and I'll get it if we email it to them. There's a lot of information that I, I didn't share today that I'd be happy to, to continue talking about. Oh, we don't have our emails on there. <laughs> Thank you guys. Like I said, I'm gonna take a screenshot of the chat and then we'll make sure that we directly email those who want want the presentation. All right, well, thank you guys so much for attending and we're happy that you guys enjoyed it.